you to Magic the Gathering for sponsoring a portion of this video. The Mitsubishi Lancer Evolution. Beautiful, isn't it? A rally car for the road, a millennial icon burned into our collective memory through movies, video games, and anime. Undoubtedly, one of the most desired cars for anyone born after 1985. Thanks to this car, Mitsubishi was gonna be cool forever. At least that's what I thought. Today, Mitsubishi's lineup is boring. Why? How could they, how dare they kill off their most iconic model in favor of crossover SUVs and commuter cars? Well, it's because they don't care what you think. Are they tone deaf? Why do they stop making cool cars? Is this a good decision? Why don't they care what we think? Today we're gonna look at the long and frankly strange troubled history of Mitsubishi and see if they can survive without having a single performance car in their lineup. I did a bunch of digging to find out what was behind this total branding 180 and what I found out was crazy. Thanks to Magic the Gathering for sponsoring a portion of today's video. Welcome, friends, to today's expansive and never-before-traveled journey through the plain of Kaladesh. Call me, Jameth of Donatarium, as I guide the grand delinquent voyage through arduous mountain terrain, wind-whipped plains as cataclysmic gear hooks and ether theorists run rampant in a classic Armageddon of fierce foes. But do not fear! Yes, are you coming down for dinner? Babe! I am in the middle of something, and I told you to call me Jameth. Okay, sweetie, hope you win your game. I'll get those dino nuggies in the oven for you. <laughs> <clears throat> Where was I? Ah, yes. Let the games begin. Oh, a mere mortal. This should be easy. Let me just lay my demon of dark schemes. <laughs> what? No, 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 no! <laughs> ah! <laughs> I got you again, James. You almost had me that time. Tell you what, if you ever beat me, I'll help you get your AE86 actually running. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Later, buddy. See you next time. Magic the Gathering has always been a fun experience, and now it's even more fun despite me taking constant L's with Magic the Gathering Arena. It's their free-to-play online game featuring their most up-to-date card sets and mechanics from Magic the Gathering. It's really cool, as the arena makes it easy for anyone to learn the game and become a master, honing their skills at their own pace. They even have all kinds of new game modes like draft and brawl, and special in-game events offer exciting prizes, and who knows, you could even be the next Magic Pro with eSports quality. Qualifiers. So what are you waiting for? There's no better time to start playing, so click on the link in the description below to start playing MTG Arena for free today. And maybe you'll get matched with old Jameth. That portion of the video was brought to you by Magic the Gathering. This is the Eclipse Cross. It's a crossover SUV and it made a lot of people a lot of mad. Why? Well, the name. The Eclipse is one of Mitsubishi's most iconic cars, second to the Evo. It was a true sports car, and as we'll see, it was integral to the tuning scene here in the States. The Fast and the Furious might not be around if it wasn't for this car. It's that important. To put that name on this is bold, to say the least. People lost their marbles when Mitsubishi first announced this thing. But as I'll keep reminding you, Mitsubishi doesn't care what you think. Mitsubishi is not just a car company. The Mitsubishi most people know is Mitsubishi Motors, a small subsidiary of the Mitsubishi Corporation, which has their hands in pretty much every industry, including energy, banking, mining, farming, and real estate. With cars playing a relatively small role within the Mitsubishi business universe, this actually makes Mitsubishi Motors a more interesting company to examine than other OEMs, in my opinion. If your business doesn't necessarily rely on cars to survive, how does that influence what kind of cars you build? That's an exciting question to me. Mitsubishi started building cars in 1918 when the Mitsubishi Shipbuilding Company churned out the Model A, which was Japan's first production car, with a run of 22 units. Fast forward 50 years and Mitsubishi Motors is looking to get into America, but they can't do it alone. So they linked up with Chrysler in Detroit to bring their Gallant to the States under the name Dodge Colt. 
This is what's called a captive import. A car built somewhere else as one name, brought to another country and sold as something else. The relationship was symbiotic in nature. Imagine Dodge as this urchin crab, trying to protect itself from increasing demands for compact, fuel-efficient cars, and Mitsubishi as this fire urchin, just trying to make its way across the Pacific. The relationship is mutually beneficial for both parties. Dodge meets consumer and regulatory demands, and Mitsubishi gets to vibe out. And ride on a crab, which sounds pretty rad. While Mitsubishi was still a small player in the US, the story was a little different around the globe. Mitsubishi Motor Company realized the potential of motorsports as marketing and entered the Galant in rallies to show off its reliability, and it really paid off. In 1972, the Galant won the demanding Australian Southern Cross Rally, starting a five-year event-winning streak for Mitsubishi and a proud tradition in rally racing, which we'll dive into a little deeper later. The rally wins boosted Mitsubishi's reputation all over the world and increased demand. And this was great news because their pal Chrysler wanted to build a global car brand. So they acquired a piece of Mitsubishi with long-term plans to eventually buy the entire company. That strategy wouldn't pan out, but there would be some pretty cool cars to come out of the Chrysler partnership, like the Starion Conquest, 3000 GT Stealth, and the aforementioned Eclipse. By 1980, Mitsubishi was building 1 million cars a year, and Chrysler was importing more than 100,000 of them into the US. This number was bumping up against the voluntary import limit Japanese manufacturers were abiding by in the US, so Mitsubishi had to get clever to sell more cars. So they did what other OEMs like Honda and Toyota did, and decided to plant their roots in the US, the big old factory in normal Illinois. Go Wildcats! Iron Man, you're all right. To help build the new facility, Chrysler put in $325 million, half of what was needed. This renewed venture between Mitsubishi and Chrysler was called Diamond Star Motors. With the factory complete in 1988, it began pumping out one car under a number of different badges. The Plymouth Laser, Eagle Talon, and Mitsubishi Eclipse. It was the beginning of a defining era for Mitsubishi in the States. While the Laser and Talon were styled by Chrysler, all the design work underneath was done by Mitsubishi. The two-door coupe was intended to be a sporty treat for the masses, but greasy Nocturners quickly discovered something very interesting about the Eclipse triplets. The engine. The Eclipse was available with Mitsubishi's 4G63 inline-4 engine, the same engine Mitsubishi was putting in their Lancer Evo rally cars over in Japan. In stock form, the turbocharged 4G63T made 180 horsepower, not bad, but those tuners were looking to make a lot more, and because the engine had a cast iron cylinder block, it was able to take a lot more boost than it made from the factory. The ceiling for tuning these motors was really high. You couple that with also available all-wheel drive and super aerodynamic styling, and you have a car pretty much hand-built for drag strip glory. Because of these features, the Eclipse helped jumpstart the fledgling import tuner scene here in America, and thus carved out Mitsubishi's place in the car nerd canon, making their current lineup today even more confusing. At the time, Mitsubishi had a devoted following and a strong brand identity. At that time, it seems they did care what you think. Further proof of the Eclipse's importance in tuner history is the second-gen DSM's inclusion in the Fast and the Furious. So with all this history, it's disappointing to see the Eclipse name being used on a crossover instead of a sports car. But as we'll see later, it might be for the best. As far as I'm concerned, the Evo was the tip of the brand identity spear. I was curious what the actual sales numbers for those cars were, so I spent a lot of time looking up data, I learned how to make a graph in Google Sheets, I got to work. This line right here is the Lancer Evolution's sales in the US for the life of the model. And here's the line for Eclipses from the second gen because I couldn't find first gen numbers. And here's the line for Mitsubishi's overall sales. Oh, that's bad. Huh. If these numbers are anything to go by, people in the US didn't give a hoot about Mitsubishi's little rally car. Maybe a better way to say it is that people who could afford to buy one didn't give a hoot. Right around the time the Evo finally came to the US, Mitsubishi was falling off a cliff. What the heck happened? Well, I'll tell you. That little point right there is Mitsubishi's peak in the US so far. In 2002, Mitsubishi sold just under 346,000 vehicles. Seven years later, they'd reach rock bottom with 53,986. Take a hurt, man, that sucks. Trouble started in 2000, when Chrysler continued their pursuit to buy Mitsubishi. Chrysler at the time had merged with Daimler, the parent company of brands like Mercedes, Maybach, and Freightliner. Daimler Chrysler bought a 34% stake in Mitsubishi. And remember, 
This was part of Chrysler's plan to buy a global brand with plants around the world. Unfortunately, Daimler Chrysler's purchase could not have come at a worse time. Less than one month since the $2 billion deal was signed, news broke that Mitsubishi did a boo-boo. Under US and Japanese law, automakers must tell the government about defects reported by customers. Mitsubishi didn't do that. Mitsubishi hadn't done that since 1977. That's bold. I guess they didn't care what the government thought either. As a result, Mitsubishi recalled over 600,000 cars in 2000, costing the company an estimated $69 million. Nice. Even though most of the cars affected were in Japan, 50,000 of them were American vehicles. Probably not the impression you want to make when someone just gave you $2 billion. A lot of high-level people at Mitsubishi claim to have no knowledge of the cover-up, which, I don't know, is possible, I guess, but come on. Interestingly, the recall was three years before Mitsubishi hit their peak, so that wasn't the culprit in their sales slump, though I suspect it played a large part. The defect cover-up was a gut punch to Mitsubishi's stock, and to make matters worse, the company had a lot of debt that was starting to pile up. You'd expect for Daimler Chrysler to bail them out. After all, Mitsubishi was their door into the Asian market, and they wouldn't want to lose that, right? That was the whole freaking point of the partnership. But the troubles were causing Daimler Chrysler to get cold feet, and they slowly started selling off their stake in Mitsubishi, eventually severing all ties by 2005. Knowing this, it's actually pretty amazing that the Evo made it to the US at all. We got really lucky. With the looming debt and shaky ground beneath them, Mitsubishi could have easily scrapped any plans to bring it here, not to mention letting it stay here for 13 years. I think we gotta count our blessings on this one. A side effect of the Daimler Chrysler Mitsubishi divorce was the Evolution 10, which would be a radical step forward for the beloved rally car. The new Evo launched in 2007, and gone was the legacy 4G63T, and in its place was the aluminum block 4B11T, which immediately made diehards worried. An aluminum block? Are you kidding me, dude? There's no way it'll be as strong as the cast iron block. Mitsubishi had to make the switch to meet emissions regulations, but some people saw that change as the company losing a little bit of its character. Of course, those people will be proven wrong by just as, if not better, performance from the new aluminum engine, but hey, a legacy like that isn't going to be forgotten that quickly. Also, the Evo 10 styling was a little too much for some people. I personally liked it a lot and still do. I still get excited when I see them, but it's really a matter of personal preference. To make matters worse, Mitsubishi closed their performance division Rally Art in 2010, signaling the end of a motorsports era at the company. I told you, they don't care what you think. Things weren't just tough for the Evo, but for Mitsubishi as a whole. From their peak in the early 2000s, Mitsubishi America's sales were in a nosedive. Over the next 10 years, units sold would fall nearly 600%, from over 345,000 in 2002 to 57, 790 in 2012. Something had to be done and fast. During the long slide down, Mitsubishi announced a new strategy for the US in 2011. This plan is responsible for the company's huge shift from the funky and fun image they had to something a little less exciting that we see today. The key to the plan was to stop producing region-specific cars for the US and bring Mitsubishi's global lineup here but still produce them in Illinois. I think that's pretty cool. By 2014, the Endeavor SUV, Galant Sedan, and the third gen Eclipse would be donezo. The end of the Eclipse was surprising, being their longest lasting model, but considering the Eclipse only sold 7,500 units in 2011, the decision was justified. One car that Mitsubishi kept alive was the Lancer, as the small sedan made up a good chunk of their sales. Something interesting to note on our sales graph is the relatively stable sales of Lancers through the 2010s, seemingly unaffected by the wild fluctuation of the company's sales as a whole. I have no idea what this data suggests, other than that the Lancer filled a small but dedicated niche in the market, which only makes the model's 2017 death in the US even more painful. So which cars would be filling in the lineup with the region-specific cars gone? Well. Some really strange ones, to be honest. In 2011, Mitsubishi announced the iMe EV electric car, a new global small car, and new hybrids. So, how'd that work out? I'll tell you. <laughs> Mitsubishi's new strategy was off to a strong start until 2016, when, on April 20th, news broke that Mitsubishi had been, quote, manipulating test data to overstate the fuel economy of some of their Japanese models going back to 1991. 
Think Dieselgate, but with cute JDM microcars. At first, Mitsubishi owned up to only lying about four of their cars, but it turns out that they also lied about 13 other cars that were involved. Not a good look. And their investors thought so too. Mitsubishi stock plummeted 50% and made company leadership look really bad. <laughs> yeah, that would. So the new strategy wasn't off to a great start, but looking at our graph, sales in the US don't look like they were affected that much. All right, so borderline criminal negligence aside, what did Mitsubishi do right? Where are they headed today? Let's talk about those global cars they brought over here. That new global smart car they teased turned out to be the Mirage, a tiny, colorful, affordable commuter car. The Mirage is one of the cheapest cars for sale in the US with a 2020 MSRP of $13,995. And hey, it's available with a manual. Next was the Outlander Hybrid, which my boys up in Canada thought was pretty good. And that's where the US lineup is today. They make three different versions of the Outlander, two Mirages, and the Eclipse Cross. Okay, so Mitsubishi took one of their most iconic names, added Cross to the end, as in crossover SUV, then made it look like this. Some people really hate it, but I will admit it does look better in person. But regardless of looks, I can't deny that the Eclipse Cross was a step over the line when it came to Mitsubishi's brand identity, or more accurately, the lack thereof. 20 years ago, Mitsubishi had sports cars. They were cool. The Eclipse, the Evo, the GTO, which I didn't even talk about. These were all cars that high schoolers wanted. I don't think that holds true for their lineup today. That being said, if I had a brand new Mirage when I was in high school, I'd be pretty stoked. My point is, Mitsubishi no longer makes cars that car nerds like myself want to buy. But as the title of this video states, Mitsubishi doesn't care what you think. And I think that's because these boring cars are working. Mirage sales absolutely crushed Evo 10 figures in the last three years of the rally car's life. The Mirage even outsold the regular Lancer before that died. And let's talk about that Outlander. As of last year, it made up a strong 61% of Mitsubishi sales with over 74,000 units sold. Add the Eclipse Cross into that, and SUVs make up 77% of Mitsubishi's business in the US. The pandemic has greatly affected sales this year, which I'm not surprised, but once things calm down, I expect Mitsubishi to get back into the groove. Their identity isn't about motorsports anymore, but about giving people as much value as they can, and that strategy seems to be working out for them even if they have a long way to go to reach their 2002 peak. And I mean a long way to go. Thank you very much for watching Wheelhouse this week. Let me know in the comments what your favorite Mitsubishi is. I, it is a toss up for me between the second gen Eclipse and I think the Evo 8. Just let me know, man. I, I think Mitsubishi was a really cool brand and now they're just trying something different. I wish them the best, honestly, because uh, it's cool to have variety in the market. Hey, we have a podcast called Past Gas. It's an in-depth history podcast. They're like hour-long episodes. It's a lot of fun. I do it with James and Joe. Uh, please check that out on any platform that you of your choosing. Follow Donut on all social media, at Donut Media. Follow me at Nolan J. Sykes. Mitsubishi, I love you. Be kind. I'll see you next time.